One tale of one who longed for adventure. There was once a man who was interested in exotic travel, and he heard there was someone giving a lecture on such. So he went, and he listened, and he left, and thought about it some, the end. <laughs> Men in prison see bars separating them from freedom. But what's weird is that they see the bars as being something totally external to their position when they are equally a part thereof. The bars are as close to them as they are distant from them, which is the natural structure of man's routine awareness. There was once a traveling caravan which claimed it could teach you how to be sick. <laughs> Did it ever stop in your town? <laughs> Every orthodontist knows when your bite is off, your jaw is fatigued. But where is the specialist to make a relative observation regarding the conclusion one holds related to one's mental vitality? The simple ride horses too wild, while the sophisticates opt for driven carriages. And the few who want to go where neither care to tread must provide their own way around. Gad, said one traveler, but it's great to be all alone, especially when you have no choice. Gads and more gads. The environment of a man is the environment of all men, but by the mind individualizing it, men are relieved temporarily from having to face the overall fact. A man once said, I don't want to be relieved, and his grandmother was startled. I had no idea you had transcendental leanings. <laughs> Legend tells of one man's appearance before the great bar of infinite justice after his death, whereat he was asked by the mighty eternal judge to tell the court of the loftier, more conscious activities he pursued and experienced during his lifetime. And the man replied, well, to tell you the truth, Your Honor, I'd always black out before mentally reaching my higher aims. <laughs> Most people believe that the world's great ideas come from books. What a curious notion. <laughs> Blues for those not making it under normal city conditions. Oh, if troubles were money, I wouldn't have a single dime. <laughs> Dig it. If you don't play the game, why, well, you can't even lose the game and several priests, politicians, and morticians raise the objection, a man's livelihood is no game. No. And yet, if you play by city rules, it is, and a serious one at that, regardless of the illusion of winning or losing. Oh, if bad luck was dollars, I'm proud to say I'm broke. Oh. In the interest of fair play, we will now present some info in rebuttal to several recent stories we covered regarding a certain matter. Note, were it not for sores in the mouth, mankind would not have any of the various cultural, religious, political, and artistic institutions he now enjoys. In fact, civilization itself would be doubtful. The Fabric of Consciousness to those of certain sensitive touch, different thoughts have their own unique texture. And exactly how, asked the elder monk of a neophyte, would you describe Buddha mind? And the younger one thoughtfully replied, uh, I'd say about a 42 long. <laughs> a boy asked his father, why do men believe in things they can't see, such as gods, demons, and supernatural forces of all kinds, when they won't believe in what's right before their eyes? And the old man thought to himself, there may be hope for that little fucker yet. <laughs> Only moribund minds find certain ideas controversial. Regressive some can be, but controversial is just childish tug-of-war carried out 
in a cemetery. A man wrote to the right to me, doctor, and asked him, is the actual difference between being normally conscious and being more so that in the first instance you're just conscious and that's it, while in the latter case you're conscious and conscious of being so? Tell me, doctor, is that it? To which the doctor replied, you misspelled difference. <laughs> the problem with certain descriptions. Every time you say that, one who knows the secret would be like this, or would be like that. You move the heat a bit away from the fire. The solution, of course, is to be able to hear with a discernible ear. <coughs> on one planet, they say that men on Earth are but a metaphor for something else, unseen and unsuspected. The purpose of the seriousness with which men hold their individual personalities is so they'll never even have the slightest inclination to ever see themselves as an allegory or representation of anything other than what they immediately seem to be. City philosophical dictum update. I'm me, therefore I am. I'm man, man's normal state of mental indebtedness and certain efforts by some to get out, to get out under therefrom. In an attempt to escape his creditors, one man changed their name. <laughs> How the various human institutions continue to survive, even flourish, in spite of the fact that their goals are never achieved. The normally sick, who don't want to get well, know well which physicians to avoid. Those who believe in great secret knowledge do so, not based on any facts, but on their own needs. Run-of-the-mill burrows would not continue to plod toward the horizon were they too suspicious of what lay ahead. <coughs> Men have no trouble living, it, living the instinctive life to the hilt. Just look at protruding stomachs but few attempt anything remotely similar with their intellect. The simple love dogmatic statements. No, I mean it. <laughs> A chap wrote to the anti-meritious man and asked him just what constitutes being simple. And the non-pretentious one replied, doing and especially thinking, only that which is natural to you. Several of the many legends concerning the mystical Orient Express. One is that it never really leaves the station and it is the passengers who move. Another is that there is no engineer up front and that it is the conductor who the passengers see in the aisle who's actually operating the train. Hmm. And still another says that on some of its journeys, the conductor dresses up like a clown as a test of some sort. <laughs> and perhaps the strangest of all the legends is that the express does not even exist and that the belief that it does is kept alive solely by those on it. <laughs> yes, yeah, says one man, there's your benefit of history over myth. One of them's not true. <laughs> yeah. The ordinary mind looking for the secret is like a kid in a closet who wants to see what the dark's like in there, but who won't close the door. <laughs> As soon as man became sufficiently conscious to invent language and grammar, he came up with the idea of the period. Souls to enjoy at least some passing sensations of finality and conclusion. Yet another reason you see so few dead, awakened people. <laughs> Although such is likely not required by the up-to-date and sophisticated, we nonetheless bring you this health tip for a solid, city living. To treat his headache, one man developed a really good case of diarrhea. <laughs> Even before men could think in any manner resembling focused, they could point here and there to distract themselves. Huh? 
No. Uh, subservient wolves will await the dominant one to feed them. Same as men will wait for other men to tell them what's what. But leads to conclusions you too hastily leap. Note this. Both counts are doing quite nicely. Thank you. <laughs> and of your rights. What you just said is the very type of thing that keeps ordinary people like myself from ever really getting interested in the kinds of things you generally talk about. I say this in spite of the fact that while I understand what I mean by this, it actually makes no sense whatsoever if you reread it and think about it. <laughs> My question to you, sir, is why do you persist in saying things that are so confusing amidst all the other stuff you talk about? And P.S., I'm aware of the fact that I misspell whatsoever. <laughs> Yours, a viewer. The normal balance of mental interest amongst ordinary men is such that for every thousand works of art devoted to man's possible higher level of consciousness, there's 180 billion zillion not. <laughs> Least amuse one guy's, makes them easier to find. Yeah. Hey, was that a joke or something? Yeah. One small way to keep yourself from ever getting close to the secret. It's to continue to say things that you have no real interest in nor understand. In city ballrooms, you don't need music to dance. All you need is talk. But now in the general interest of health, we feel obliged to offer an opposing view of the above. Without the normal flow of natural talk, adults are not properly immunized. If anything was as sticky to the body as thoughts are to the mind, we'd spend all our time picking stuff off us. <laughs> Which, in reference to things intellectual, might not be such a bad idea. <laughs> as long as you can name your oppressors, you will have oppressors. The young dream of their future, while the old look back on their past. But the minds of man and Toto cannot be said specifically to be either here or there at the present moment. For select passengers on the express, the danger in undiagnosed train sickness is that it can come up on you simply through aging and get you heaved off like a dead sack of last month's mail. At normal, horizontal city level, one sure sign that you're becoming a mental being is that you've developed mental problems. One guy at the zoo looked at the baboon in his cage and said, believe me, you've got no idea how weird it is being here, which the primate interpreted to mean you've got no idea how weird it is being human. A technical note you might find of interest is the fact that in his thinking, the baboon misspelled the word human. <laughs> as part of its continuing dedication to making life, man's life here as fair and equitable as possible under the circumstances, things are arranged so that most people never get smart enough to realize how dumb they are. What? Oh. When the simple get sick, they simply get sick. But as men become more horizontally advanced and sophisticated, they begin to ascribe metaphysical significance to all their ills. A curious turn, wouldn't you say? The total picture of all human dissatisfaction and non-fulfillment exposed and explained in four words. Stomachs growl, minds dream. Class dismissed. The heroics of the more conscious are mostly myths. The unstated city credo. I don't fully admire nobody till they're completely dead. But on the other hand, an awakened man doesn't miss himself even after he's gone. On some evolving worlds, men live in a fog. On others, it and them. After a long, long voyage, one man said, I can almost put my finger on it. Which, of course, is not the correct part of the anatomy, but we assume he speaketh metaphorically. 
the subsequent song of a seeker who finally found something. Oh, you can look out the window and look under the bed, but everywhere you'll look will just be a prelude. <laughs> Query, what kind of idiot blind man place, blames objects for not being seen? The nose can be smashed, the mind only offended. Which is one reason you so seldom see the more conscious bleeding from the head. That was it. <laughs> it's all the news. Picking up a piece of what we were talking about last time, of how there seems to be a kind of progression in the overall history of man, when they have attempted to offer some explanation as to why they continually at the individual and at the mass level, engage in activities that by no one's definition can be deemed profitable. And the first stage is when men externalize and identify, or when men identify external forces, gods and demons, the stars and etc as being the source of whatever powers affect their lives over which they cannot offer any viable opposition. And then it would apparently be a, an improvement, a move forward. They take it as such that the more sophisticated, the less simplistic, look internally as opposed to externally. And they begin to ascribe to internal forces such as the subconscious traumas, uh, unbearable memories that lead them into activities that are unprofitable, indefensible, inexplicable. And we sort of left it last time of me asking you the question of what comes next. Normal people do not look for it any further next because if the mind can perceive that there has been two steps that men have gone, let us say, from standing up to their waist and shit and moving to a higher ground to where they're only up to their knees, that's the end of the observation. That's all they care to read about. They hear about that, that a certain group of people have gone from absolutely nefarious ways of killing all the female children born in their village, well, they've gone to the point now they only kill 50% of them. People go that have any interest and go, oh, well, okay. And that seems to be the end of it. We have gone from offering human sacrifices to sacrificing our in-laws, I'm sorry, <laughs> goats and sheep. For you people who have never been married, that was a smattering of humor. I was going to expand upon it, still leaving what comes next. I'm leaving that to you for the time being, but a expansion of one part of that is something that's been going on throughout history and it continues to make itself felt to such a degree that it spurs opposition, overt opposition. And it just so happens that you've lived during that lifetime, during such a span. But it goes like this. It is men not only externalizing, but personalizing in a non-personalized way the forces that seem to be operating to their detriment, the problems of humanity, uh, such as, here we go, of men speaking of crime being rampant in their neighborhood, not of criminals, 
of crime being rampant. Speaking of the problem of narcotic addiction, not the problem of addicts. And on the surface, from one view, this is patent foolishness. And it can and has been already uh, criticized as being men's attempt to abrogate their own personal responsibility. Was it clear enough or do I spend 30 minutes beating that son of a bitch into the ground? It is common now as you, you're so used to it that if you're only listening right now with your ordinary mind, you won't even catch the significance of it because it is now a part and wolf or a weasel and weevil for those of you in the fabric trade. In what country, I don't know, but in those of you who might be in the fabric <coughs> biz, as we like to say, who are not in the fabric biz, <laughs> it is now a part of standard reality in the sophisticated parts of the world. It's to refer to things as being a non-personalized problem and not the, the individuals engaged in it as being the problem. That now the more sophisticated you are, in the ordinary sense of that word, the more you would be inclined to refer to the problem of crime, the problem of alcoholism, the problem of narcotic addiction, the problem of antisocial behavior, as absolutely opposed to pinpointing criminals, addicts, alcoholics, and the antisocial. Then you have, I repeat to you, for those of you who are not aware of it, this is absolutely nothing new. Humans have been doing this, but you are now, as I said, you have lived through another rise of it. But it is now, has become so much in the mainstream of ordinary thought in the modern world, the sophisticated parts of the world, that it has, as always, produced its own growing opposition of people quite outside this sort of activity, just part of the mainstream of life itself, now standing up and saying that uh, we're going too far in our attempt to be uh, psychologically magnanimous to our fellow man, that we are now letting people relieve themselves of the responsibility for their own actions. That instead of us saying, well, by God, you're a criminal. You went out and you held up a fruit stand so that you could feed your damn narcotic habit. Shame on you. <laughs> that no, nah, that's a bit harsh. That's just, that's simply not the right, that is not the more civil, even enlightened attitude, as they like to call it. That if you look, all, this, all it will take is a cursory glance once you know how to do it. That is, once you're an ordinary, up-to-date person, you can simply look at the man or woman and ask them one or two questions if it's not obvious, and immediately, through that penetrating mind that is so indigenous to modern man, immediately realize that it's not strictly his fault. This is a societal problem. This is that, in fact, we're wasting our time. We're now back, knowing that humanity is always like, we're back now worrying about the symptom which, by God, we should be past that point. We've had thousands of years to realize that we can't keep dealing with symptoms. We can't just deal with a criminal. We've got to deal with criminality. We've got to stop worrying about all these little, just one or two criminals here, or alcoholics or drug addicts. Or, we've got to stop wasting our time because those are mere symptoms. What we've got to do is look for the cause. <sighs> well, I can say that a real challenge in as much as it is hidden, boy. Yeah, boy, good luck to them ever finding that. For those of you that's never had any real face-to-face -face confrontation with life as it is, see, that again was a just a kind of a throwaway scintilla of attempted humor <laughs> under the guise of sarcasm. <laughs> Do you realize you can make mincemeat from one view out of that view, out of that argument. You can say, well, it is absolutely 
foolish. It, it is not based upon any reality. It's based on wishful thinking. It's based on, in our day and time, uh, whoever the critics would be would very likely fall into uh, such terms as it's based upon some kind of fuzzy headed logic or fuzzy logic, pseudo thinking of liberal minded people, of social reformers. It's just, you can make it appear to be absolutely foolish once it's pointed out. You can say this grammatically foolish, which is a reflection of what should be solid, sequential, logical thinking. You can turn on the whole idea once you hear it stated that we, we should not be worrying about individual criminals. What we've got to worry about is criminality. Or for someone to say, well, the biggest problem in our city or the biggest problem in our day, in our era, in our area is crime. You think, well, don't say crime, say criminals. There's no such thing as crime. It's not there floating around. Crime does not hide in an alleyway and jump out and mug you. <laughs> and then you can get into things like, there's no alcoholic problem. There are problems with people who drink alcohol. And it's like, oh, no, that's too simplistic. Then you could uh, just make mincemeat of that from one view and say, oh, you mean there are people just sitting at home or driving along in their car, minding their own business, just ordinary, decent people, and suddenly, while they're not noticing, maybe they get, it's sunny, and they kind of doze off in this bottle. <laughs> Johnny Walker. <laughs> Jack Daniels, according to your taste, waits until an opportune moment and slips up, <laughs> crawls up your leg, and maybe you're just kind of dozing off, you uh, and it just forces itself in your mouth. You can make it sound ridiculous, but is it? <laughs> At least you, anyone watching this, take it as, uh, take my examples to be too narrowly focused. Uh, also, religion has been doing this for as long as you have the history of man. Uh, probably in the Western version, the most common manifestation of it being uh, phrases such as uh, Allah, God, the great spirit, although hates the act of sin, that is going against what he said, he hates sin, but he loves the sinner. As you divide the action from the person. Now that is according to your acceptable written history, is about 4,000 years old, at least you think that uh, the kind of examples I was pointing out before, under more civil, non-secular conditions, non-clerical conditions, at least you think that was just some sort of upshot and some offshoot from the Freudian era. It is not. Simply the nomenclature changes because always has man's mind and for those of you watching a new, may I point out to you, I am not actually talking about religion or politics or psychology. It's not what I'm talking about. But so religion has been offering that same, presenting that same dichotomy, which all of this I'm about to get to, as you should suspect, it has to do with the basis of man's thinking. The structure of the way the mind works is not religion. Uh, at fault. It's not even religion in action. It's just simply a manifestation of it. It's not politics and it's not psychology. But religion has been offering that externalization that eventually you have to get around to make people join the church and pay their money. You've finally got to get around to making them individually feel guilty in some way or they won't pay. Guilt being a form of hypno uh, hypnosis because who but an idiot is going to pay for something that they can't see, that doesn't exist, and they can find no benefit in. I'm sorry, that was too pushy. Uh, <laughs> scratch that. Don't, don't even try, don't even answer that to yourselves rhetorically. <clears throat> sorry. But religion has, uh, in an overall manner, been, has already established and been using that premise of separating a man from the acts of men. Because to say that God loves, uh, God loves a sinner but hates his sin. 
You understand what they mean by that, even if you're not a religious person. That God hates it because, or else you can't explain. There's no chance religion won't work, neither will psychology, neither will any of man's social institutions. But back to religion for a second, so that you'll see that this is not a Johnny-come-lately phenomenon. They have to eventually bring together some just over the horizon way in which this will all merge. The easy answer being, well, it, I know it doesn't make sense now, but will you die? <laughs> 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 which is always, I should have written a news item about that, and for a kid to ask his father, how is it that humans spend decades, an individual with, and thousands of dollars on education, and then reach the point to say, well, sure, life doesn't make any sense, but it will after I'm dead. <laughs> Maybe I should have written it before I stood here and wrote it on the spot. <laughs> a kid asked his father, how come it is that men think they're going to stand more when they're dead when they don't understand squat while they're alive? <laughs> well, that's it. I'm not going any further. But while you're alive, the general presentation of religion has long ago established this division of non-personalizing problems by saying God loves the, the sinner. That as you show up and you go, well, I've listened to the tenets of your religion. I've listened to what you claim to be the way in which a man should live. And I've got to tell you the truth. Up until now, I have lived almost in direct opposition there too. In the church, the religion, which is the civil part of man's overall progression, the church has to say, well, no, that's all right. We all do it because here's, here's the redeeming feature. Here's the redeeming grace of humanity vis-a-vis -vis our great father and that is although he hates the sin in you he loves you and quite grown up people with suits and ties and good haircuts and education high school and higher will listen to that and go well thank God I mean people that you sit them down with a decent cup of coffee or just set them down and say, do you, do you figure that you can think about as well as anybody and that you're rational? And they go, yes. And you think, and you're the guy I just heard nod and be relieved when it was pointed out that although God hates sin, the sin in you, he loves the sinner. And you think, what a relief. <laughs> do I have to keep replaying that one? <laughs> And you ask yourself, are these people sane by, by their own definition? Are they ordinary, mainstream, everyday, intellectual, bourgeoisie? Are they logical, sane? Are they the ones running the whole world, apparently? And the answer is yes. But think about that and then think about that they will gradually grasp and embrace the idea that although God loves the sin, I mean, hates the sin, he loves the sinner. Which, if you don't like that and you're more sophisticated, hey, there are things that society will not accept, but it has to do with the behavior, not with the person. And of course, they've gone sort of a step further. Well, their own version of subconscious traumas, which is simply, uh, the devil made me do it. Demonic forces loosed in me, over which I've got no control. God knows I try. But you know there's some things that no one can help. And of course, you say it to any sane person, from a judge to a rabbi to a psychologist to almost anybody. And they go, yeah, well, how true. Back to how you can make foolish mincemeat out of the argument from one view. To say, well, that is absolutely the most transparent attempt. I'm taking up this position right now. I'm repeating it. That someone can say, if they were uh, anti-cleric, if they were anti-psychology, if they were just sort of run-of-the-mill contemporaneous soreheads, I'm just speaking in general for this attitude, they could say, this whole idea that crime is rampant, that crime is tearing society apart, you people, you're idiots. If you mean that, you're absolute idiots. You, you've been thinking too much, I don't know what happened, something's wrong with you. Crime is not rampant. Criminals are. Show me some crime. Go arrest some crime. And you can just make it sound ridiculous. You can do it with religion. 
Life does not deal in that which is ridiculous. <laughs> I guess I should clarify that. Those things in which life deals <laughs> that humans might label as ridiculous does not indicate that the thing they are observing is ridiculous. You're looking the wrong place. Look at the human view of it. Ridiculous and foolish is normally a very safe catch-all for that which cannot be understood. I mean, there it is, and people are doing it, and they perhaps have more power than you do. They perhaps have better cars, better positions than you do. And your mind looks at that and goes, I'm not going to say it out loud because I could lose my job. I might suffer financially, but goddamn, these people are idiots. What's wrong with them? They're just foolish. That's right, don't ever look in the wrong place. Keep looking out there and going, that's true, that's foolish. That's foolish by their own propositions. What they're doing is absolute insanity. It is just illogical. They're living a life of non sequiturs. But <laughs> just keep looking out there. I mean, at least perhaps you trip and hurt your toe. But back to, without any doubt, you, it is from one view, and one quite sane, rational view, it is just blatant, unadulterated, transparent foolishness. There is no such thing as crime that we can deal with. You can't arrest crime. You cannot rehabilitate crime. There's no such thing as alcoholism. You don't go down to hospitals and find alcoholism in the wards. You don't find alcoholism tied up in beds. You don't find alcoholism being treated with vitamin B shots. You find people. You find alcoholics. You do not find crime in prisons. You find prisoners. So you can just make it appear to be foolish. Let me point out to you what it is. For a man to press on in his present conditions, this externalization, this personalizing in an external way of what men perceive to be problems is absolutely necessary in his present condition for humanity to press on. Even at mundane levels, it's normally assumed that uh, if a man speaks on some subject, let us say for 30 minutes, that at the end of the 30 minutes, more or less, let's say that he devoted five minutes at the end to the climax, to the conclusion of what he had to say. So if that be true, you would normally assume that the preceding 25 minutes would be, in some manner, a logical buildup to the five-minute conclusion. Where are you from? Oh, I'm sorry. It sometimes does not seem to some ears, I gather from looking, being, ex being expert or at least experienced in watching people's ears, it appears that oft times ears within the hearing of this does not find my aforementioned normal expectations of how a lecture should go to prove itself so. No. So there you are again. It's another great opportunity. It's either the fault of what's being said or the fault of what you're hearing. <laughs> and we know the answer to that, so <laughs> we'll need to waste time there. All the way from religion to up-to-date, psychological, sociological, Models of man speak in the whole, covering the whole gamut of what they perceive to be problems, not from our view, not from your view, not from mine, what they say. Just take their view of what they say. Here are the problems over which man must come. <laughs> These are the problems that may spell the end for humanity, and they list them out. And, and the areas of the world, the areas in each individual man, of course, the same thing, that are the more sophisticated, the more up-to-date, collectively speaking, the more you're in that area, 
in humanity and in an individual man, the more will he speak in an external manner of the problems, the less that they will hold theoretically now. We all know that we have mental hospitals, we know that we have drunk tanks, we know that we have a prison system. So it's not that men do not behave in manners that come in, may I say, somewhat in conflict with their theory. <clears throat> Pardon me. It's not that they do not exist, but at the highest reaches of the human expression nowadays, and it's always been so, but nowadays they speak of the problems as external, non-personalizations of what you can look at and say, well, it's an individual problem. It is not external. That you can just make absolute fun, you could get carried away, I guess, and go into spasms and choke on it <laughs> and say it is just absolutely insanity. What in the hell's wrong with people saying that crime is the problem? It's not crime. It's damn criminals. Face up to it. It's not a problem in this country of drug addiction. It's drug addicts. Nobody made them do it. Hold them responsible. And you can look at it, and from one view, if you just listen for a second, just as I said, even rhetorically, based upon the common consensus of what language means, if nothing else, you look at it and go, well, you're right. It doesn't make any sense. It's, it's crazy. It's not crazy. It's no more, it's no more crazy than the manner in which religion in all of its many forms has survived this long. Remember, I, there was a news item tonight. The title seemed to go over better with some of you, or seemed to be more significant than the body of the story. But it was labeled something about how the many, of the many human institutions managed to survive, even flourish, in spite of the fact that they failed to achieve their goals. It is not foolish that men attempt to verbally relieve the individual, to relieve themselves of the responsibility of what they perceive to be, what they define as their problems, and turn it into a non-individualistic, even verging on a non-mortal, and from a very certain view, again, non-existent, but to turn it into a non-individualistic, a non-human, non-internal, it's not the person's fault, the person doing it is as much a victim as we are. But to turn it into that, and you can say that it's absolutely insanity. For a man to press on, think about it, I've already said it twice, but for a man to press on in his present condition, assuming a man had the ability to press on or not press on, <laughs> And assuming whether I talk 25 minutes or 60 minutes that has any significance and impact on life, assuming all of that, <laughs> or assuming the real truth that was raining outside, most of you saw the sign outside, free lecture and beer and hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Gratis also. I know why you're here, so. We that is at bay. What would happen? Ask yourself this at least rhetorically, in silence. What would happen if men, for those of you who may be watching this the first time, let me re remind you, this has nothing to do, literally what I'm talking about, has nothing to do with social criticism, has nothing to do with political views, has nothing to do with psychological paradigms and opposition there too. <coughs> I'm just taking life as it's laying out there. But ask yourself rhetorically this, if men did, the mainstream of humanity, if men did hold themselves absolutely responsible for everything they did, in what, just think about it, just speculate a minute, dream, in what position, where would man be right now? We've got a couple of seconds here, just everybody try and picture that. Don't go far enough to give yourselves, as we call it in the psychological game, the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> but think about it a second, where would man be Now that I pose a problem or the question, I could also jump in right quick, as I know some of you are always are trying to encourage me to do, and I could even jump in and answer for somebody and say, wait a minute, you're completely off the mark because 
what you're inferring is that man would not be even at the ordinary civil level, the ordinary horizontal level, as I call it, of progress, who would not be as far along as we were, or as we are. And I could take this view and say, but hey, you're stepping on your own pecker, your own feet, your own ideas, because the whole history of humanity, the forward movement of humanity, is nothing but actions of individuals. It wasn't a committee that invented the light bulb. It wasn't a committee that it conceived of the internal combustion engine. It was individuals. One man taking responsibility. Well, Jesus, now I think about it. I guess we better scrap this tape and we'll start another one tonight. I, I just, never looked at it like that. Where would humanity be? if in everything other than such examples I just pointed out, which of course are specious to begin with, but where would we be if everyone was held responsible? What would things be like now? I'm not just encouraging you to take some sort of, or make some sort of historical reflection. Where would things stand right now? Just, I'm not going into it. I'm not even going to verbalize it because it is too rich. It is too fertile. It is too alluring. You should be able to see it. Right now, where would things be? Wherever you're living, your general environment, clerical, secular, from every possible view, how would things be right where you are right now if suddenly everyone was held absolutely accountable and responsible for everything they did? Now, I'm not going to give you more than three or four seconds because it is not a pretty sight to see an ordinary mind, man's mind turn into mush. Uh, as always, when you get very close to how life is actually operating, it, if you're following this right toward the end, it should be interesting in the fact that it absolutely is beginning to belie any power of speech, of verbal descriptions. Because I've just presented the question after all of this, and I said, well, just picture into yourself right now, not just historically would man have progressed as far as ahead. I offered you, challenged you to think right now, how would life be right where you are? You people watching in Paris, new people in Indiola, Mississippi. How would things be right there in your time, your place, if every individual Forget from some psychological view, from some judicial view. It's just that suddenly all men had this attitude that they were going to hold everybody, including themselves, responsible for everything they did. That's, you're just responsible, period. Not, well, I'm, re I'm responsible, but wait till I tell you the mitigating circumstance. No, no mitigating circumstance. You're responsible. I presented the challenge. What would it be like? Is it possible? What would it be like? So I was hoping that some of you would, when I was insinuating it was fertile and promising, it's fertile and promising because you're standing in the midst of it. It is a life. But after you think about it a second, what I was saying was a more a side interesting aspect. There is no real answer to that verbally. I hope I didn't hurt any of you who had already answered it to yourself. Oh, I see so-and-so. There is no real answer, not verbally. There is an answer, which is simply the reality of how things are, but there is no actual verbal uh, pertinent response to that. The obvious ones would be, uh, well, it can't be done. That'd be an obvious one. When again, by any ordinary, by man's own self-proclaimed views, that can't be true. It can be possible. Or it, could, or it wouldn't be a problem. He wouldn't be able to find that it is not operating in a toward manner now, but rather un thereof. Mm -hmm. And so therefore it can be rectified. If it couldn't be rectified, it wouldn't be fired in the first place. <laughs> yes, everybody knows that. <laughs> so to say, well, to challenge you, well, how would things be if everyone were held responsible? And forget about the overt actions Forget about that we're going to arrest everyone who does something. I'm just saying that now, theoretically, that now the mindset, 
The collective consciousness of humanity is such that everyone is responsible for what they do, period. The challenge was, what would that be like? And you could say, well, by God, things would be a lot different. <laughs> <laughs> or you could say, uh, you could say, well, they're drawing everything. Now, I'm not saying that any of these responses I was about to name, I was about to come up with, are true or false. What I was trying to get you to see is they're not true or false. There is no response to it. Then I could have left it there and say, well, we're out of tape. So ask yourself, isn't it interesting that there is no response to it? Mm -hmm. I keep doing that, and I keep looking at all these ears going. <laughs> <laughs> How can something as widespread, as, a, as a much an intrinsic part now of human consciousness as what I've been describing for the last 55 minutes. How can something that common that I've described then be put into a kind of rhetorical question such as, well, if things weren't that way, if it was not to the point that humanity in general, civilized humanity, not stupid people, not insane people, not old hermits hiding under beds and under logs, but the mainstream of life now looks at what it calls the problems of civilization, of humanity, as being external to the individual and non-personal. That is, the problem is crime, not criminals. The problem is narcotic addiction, not dope addicts. It is now so much a part, and back to religion, that its version of it, that that is now so much a part, an accepted part, of mainstream, even forward thinking, humanity, then how is it that I can, after going through all that, present the challenge, the verbal challenge, the rhetorical challenge of what if things were just the opposite, so to speak? What if human consciousness now was such that everyone was held responsible? Individually held responsible for everything, period. No other discussion. That's it. What would it be like? And then to point out, assuming that you were able to follow that, when I said there's actually no meaningful response to that. Yes, no, mate, there is none. The additional, I suggest, interesting aspect of it is, how can there be something that is a part of the common consciousness of humanity and then it be challenged, as I did, and say, well, hey, what if it's otherwise? Not oppose it, not say it's wrong. I just say, well, what would it be if it were otherwise? In this case, the opposite, so to speak. That the individuals are being held responsible. How would things be? And then assuming that you followed what I at that to which I was pointing, you come to that you would agree with what I said, that, hey, there is no real answer to that. Then the next question, the interesting, I hope more alluring poser right toward the end is, well, how can it be that you can offer a rhetorical question that is not metaphysical, it is not obscure, it is based upon reality as humanity knows it, that is, of externalizing and non-personalizing human problems rather than individualizing them, then I can take something that common and take what is almost the, the opposite approach, not as opposition to it, but an opposing approach and say, well, just picture that could be, if it's this way, then it could be otherwise, or man wouldn't describe it as being this way. So if it can be, if it is this way, it could be this other way. You can't say it could not. So people aren't. All right, now picture, what would it be like if it was like that? And then what I was trying to suggest to you that if you look at it in a certain way, you can't really do it. You hear it verbally and go, well, you're right, it could be that way. It is not physically impossible that humanity's consciousness in toto would hold each individual responsible. That is not physically, chemically, electrically, literally impossible. But you think about it, and there's nothing you can do with it. The more interesting ball at the end, I was hoping, was, why the hell? How can that be? It is too close to the secrets how it can be. Humanity could not move on in its present condition if that could be. Nobody ever thinks to hold, no other creature thinks to hold anybody responsible. I mean, you should see the obvious, just because I can prove it through anthropomorphical fables is not the proof of it. But as everyone knows, or you should know, Gazelles do not hold lions responsible for attacking them. 
Lions do not hold uh, humans responsible. Or the lions do not hold hippos responsible for thundering through the grass there on the way to a water hole and scaring away the gazelles. No creature holds anybody else responsible for anything. They don't hold themselves responsible. You can't go up to a lion that just ate this beautiful little baby gazelle and blood and guts all over it and it's laying there and you go, bad lion. You should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> the question does not arise in any creature as to who is responsible. The question of responsibility does not arise. Things simply are as they are. Now back to my challenge. Men would not, men could not press on. Humanity would not press on if they did not have the prevailing attitude I have described as open as it is to ridicule, as insane as it is, as tenuously connected to reality as it is. That I tried to do it, that was my dramatics, is to, uh, to say that, our, that the, the main problem in the world today is crime. And you think you're idiots. You're t it's criminals, it's not crime, there is no such thing. What do you know? How dare you be such a critic of life? Life knows what it's doing. You've got, if you're going to be ordinary, if you're going to stay in the mainstream in the heart of life's parade, you have got to look where everyone else looks. Or if you are a free thinker, wherever they look, look in the opposite direction. <laughs> or wherever they look, go, ha, you idiots. But whatever you do, don't try anything else. No, 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 no. First thing you know, you could, in spite of my jocular attitude, next thing you know, you could grow, I don't know, you might actually grow that goddamn third eye. <laughs> then all this would be, then you'd have your choice again. Now, then all this would either make sense or make a lot of sense. <laughs>